Last week in the book of Romans, we got a lot to cover, so let's kind of hit the ground running. Let's start in verse 8. And we're going to read through verse 17. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God whom I serve in my spirit in my preaching of the gospel, His Son is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. I pray that now at last God's will may be... <clears throat> God's. God's will, the way, may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you, so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want to be, you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to the Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Let's pray together. And I want to add one to our prayer list that we didn't add. And that's Vicki Foster. Vicki's going through some rough times right now. She's been sick and some other issues that are going on. And so I want to pray for our lesson and I want to pray for Vicki. Father God, we thank you that we can open up your word and study together today. We thank you, Lord, that you provide us a place. You've provided us a place for a long time to meet. And we just thank you today that we can open up your word and study. And we pray for our sister Vicki. We're her family here. She has no one else. We pray for her family in Michigan and just pray for her, Lord, as she's been sick and then some other issues that have been going on with her. And So, Lord, we just pray for your touch to her, that you watch over her, that you take care of her. Help us as a family express to her how much we love her, how much we care for her, and how much we want to help and be her family. We praise you for everything you give us. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, we started last week and we started talking about the power of the gospel and how that God is the center of this book. It is a message about God. It's a message about God's gospel, about God's good news. And we have good news to share. I, I like sharing good news. I had a had a guy come in the office Monday and and uh, I've known him a long time and he said hey, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be at services Sunday and and he started talking to me about our uh, association through the years we gosh we've known each other for 25 years and so he was or maybe not 25 years close to 25 years anyway and so uh, he, we started talking about the association and he of each other and everything and, and as we were talking he said um, well, what are you preaching on this Sunday and I said I'm going to talk about I said we're in the book of Romans so I'm going to talk about the good news the power of the gospel and so as we began talking he said well here's my take on the gospel and I shared a little bit of his take on the gospel and I was like that's not good news. That's not the gospel. Yeah, it is. I know it's not. 
The Bible tells us what the gospel is. Gospel means good news. It is good news. And it is to be the center of our lives. It is to be the center of who we are. It is everywhere we go, we're to be sharing the gospel. That life is not about what we're going to be doing. Life is about as we're doing what we're doing, we're sharing the gospel. That that's who we are. That that's what we're about. We think, uh, for some reason, we, we buy into the cultural aspect and, and we buy into what the American church has done uh, with some things that, that we lose sight that what we're about is the gospel. That Paul said, and we looked at this last week, we talked about him being a servant of God, being a bondservant, being a slave of God. And we don't think about living as like because we're so free in this country, we don't think about how free we are to serve God. That, that we are called to be His servants. And so uh, with that in mind, you, you think about this next part in this text that he starts off and, and he talks about how in his preaching of the gospel he longed to be there in Rome. He longed to have fellowship with them fellowship in the gospel he says I want to be there with you and he says God is my witness that I've been praying he says I want you to know how I pray for you and how I prayed that God would open up a door that I would be able to come to Rome and I'd be able to be there and I'd be able to see you and he says every, every time that door just seemed to close. It was, like, it was like it just wasn't possible for me to go and to be with you and to preach to you and not only to preach to you believers but that other people, that there would be uh, a, a relationship that, would, that, that our relationship would grow and through that relationship I would share the gospel and you would share the gospel and we'd see other people coming, other Gentiles coming to Jesus. And he says, I just long for that. And of course if you go back and you read the book of Acts, finally Paul gets that opportunity to go to, to Rome. It may not necessarily be the way he wanted to go. He wanted to go freely. He ends up going and letting the Rome pay the dime for his going. But sadly, he goes as a prisoner. Because when he's on trial in Jerusalem, he appeals to Caesar. And as a Roman citizen, one born as a citizen of Rome, he had that ability that he could just skip all the other courts and say, hey, just I'm just going to appeal to Caesar. I want to go see Caesar and let him judge the matter. And so he ends up going. But he says, I want you to know how I have longed, how I have wanted to be with you because if I'm with you and we have this fellowship together and it's a fellowship based on good news. It is a fellowship of support. It is a fellowship of that we're together. We have a fellowship. We have a bond. What is our bond? The reason that we're together today, that we have a bond together today, is because that we are all united together through the cross of Jesus. That we all understand something. The cross is the great leveler of ground. That there's no hierarchy, there's no anything. I, I don't care for hierarchy. I, I just don't. Uh, a good, good friend of mine and, and uh, that, that we've had a f kind of a friendship and, and, and it's, it's been, you know, a pretty good friendship and, and I got a little frustrated this week with him but I tease him all the time because he'll answer to hierarchy and the way the higher I finally determined how hierarchy within their group of believers is determined it's by the size of the hat the bigger the hat the more powerful you are and so I will text him every once in a while and I say well hey when you're done talking to the guy in the big hat text me back or give me a call and so, you know, in fact, I sent him a text this morning and I said to my dear cross-dressing brother, I hope church goes well today because they wear the robes and all this, you know, and so I, I love to tease. And so he texts me back and he says, to my dear camo-wearing redneck brother, I hope it goes well for you as well. You know, that we... 
I don't like hierarchy. Because when I read the New Testament, what I find in the New Testament is that the, the ground at the cross is level. And it took just as much of the blood of Jesus to cleanse my awful sins as it took to cleanse your awful sins. Because the cross means nothing if you're not a sinner. And the good news of the gospel will mean nothing if you're not a sinner. And so we come to the cross and it unites us together and it unites us in a bond of fellowship. And that fellowship is based on the fact that we have all come to Jesus. That we have all accepted the good news of Jesus. And so Paul says, I can't wait to get there. I want to be with you. I want to have this fellowship with you. I want to mutually encourage your faith and you're going to, because it's a mutual deal, you're encouraging mine. And as I was studying this, it was something that, that, that I heard and, and started thinking about and studying and I, and I said this last week and I want to say this again. That, that when we're together as a group of people, whether it be Sunday morning or our men's group or Wednesday night, or when we're together on Tuesday and we're unloading all the food. That whenever we're together, when that fellowship is together, and here we are today, and, and Melinda picked out some awesome songs for us to sing. And Linda always worries. She said, oh, I messed up last Sunday, something. My hands don't work the way I did. And I'm thinking, she's telling me that Wednesday, and I'm thinking to myself, I didn't notice it. You know why I didn't notice it? Because I love her so much and I appreciate her. She's my sister that I never had. And you know what I see? I see you, this beautiful Christian lady sitting behind that piano. I don't hear any mistake you make. I hear beautiful music, right? And Melinda saying that, singing that song. She said, one of these days I'm just going to shout. And I thought, well, maybe you ought to. <laughs> you know? What is our bond? But, but here's what I want. I want to make sure that when we're together, whatever is said and whatever is done will help somebody here in this room on Tuesday afternoon or on Thursday morning or on a deep Saturday night when you're in pain. I want what we do to make a difference. I don't want us to be a production. You know, the, the idea of church as this big fancy production is wearing thin on our culture. Because people are no longer wanting to just come and sit in either a pew or chairs and see a production up on the stage and see the, the wonder and, and all of that. That's not what they're looking for. I'm convinced that there has been a major culture shift that people are saying, if I'm going to be a part of something, I need it to make a difference so that I can make a difference. So I don't want us to be where we just come and, and, and we're together, that we're going, hey, how am I going to make a difference? How is this going to make a difference? And Paul says, I want to be there. I want to be a part of that fellowship with you. I want to... And it's, it's a mutual deal. And I'm so encouraged. Every Sunday, I'm, I'm so encouraged. I, I go home. And now there's been times where there's been, you know, things that were said or done or frustration. I mean, gosh, I've been here since dirt, you know, it seems like sometimes. All the years that I've been here and been a part of this family of believers and seen us. And, and when people call and say, tell me about the church. I say, well, we're a family. And they say, well, everybody says that. And I said, no, we're a family. Well, well, well what makes you different from the family down the road? I said, because we're dysfunctional. <laughs> and they're like, it always strikes them. They're like, well, 
Did you do? I, yeah, we're a, we're truly family because we're dysfunctional because we fuss with each other, we fight with each other. But you know what happens? You let somebody down the road say something about one of these people in this building, and they're just like siblings. They're ready to kill them. And they're like, oh, oh, okay. One Sunday I told a story about a guy calling me up and then insulting me and Bobby wanted the man's number. He was going to go kill him. <laughs> you know, he was like, hey, you don't get to talk to him that way. I'll go, I'll go kill him. And, and so we have this bond, this mutualness. And so, yes, there is this thing that, that not only do I feel like I want to be there for you, but I feel like that I could call any one of you and say, hey, I need help. And you're going to be there. You're going to say, yes, what can we do? And so he says, here we are. Well, what's the basis of all of that? Again, it comes back to the gospel. The gospel is who we are. But look further at what he says. He says, not only that, but then, you know, that's verse 8 through 13. Listen to what he says in verse 14 and 15. He says, I am obligated both to the Greeks and the non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish, and that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. He uses this term here, obligated, which is a, a debt term. It's a, it's a term of whenever you go down and you borrow money or you buy a car or you buy a house or whatever it is and you sign on the dotted line, you're saying, I'm obligated. I'm obligated to pay this debt. That, that I, will, I will meet my end of the bargain. That you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it. And so Paul uses this term here and it's translated obligated. He says I'm obligated with something. I have a debt both to the Greeks and the non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. And, that, and he says that's why I'm so eager to preach. Now, preach, we think of, well, that's what you do on Sunday. No, preach is to proclaim that here we are as a group of people. He says, I can't wait to get there to Rome and just share the good news. Because we got good news to share. You know, it, it, it's like I, I've shared this before and, and uh, I was, was teased a little bit about it a while back. About said, man, you hadn't told any old granny stories in a while. And talk about your granny in a while. And, you know, growing up with, you know, and living there on the farm with granny and granddad, you know, they had a powerful impact on my life. They kind of shaped it so it was their fault, okay? But granny used to get so mad at me because we had a party line. And she hated it if I came in the house and she was sitting there on the phone like this because she's listening in. And if I made a noise, then somebody knew she'd picked up. And she was sneaky because... Did any of you ever have a party line phone? Yeah. You, when you were on there, you knew when somebody else picked up, right? Because you heard it. And, and, and so it was funny because she could sneak that receiver up and listen. She could listen to what the neighbors were talking about. What used to get me is that Florence and Gladys used to talk. That was some of our neighbors. They'd just pick up the phone and talk to each other. They just kind of had a set time. <laughs> They'd be together all day long and then they'd tie up the party line by picking up the phone and talking to each other. You're like, wow, you know, tied up, tied up everything. But once somebody could call and Granny could be busy because she was always busy doing something around the house and I would answer the phone and somebody would tell me, hey, tell your Granny this, you know, some bit of bad news, you know. And so I would tell Granny that. One of the worst times that I ever got in trouble with my granny was we got some bit of bad news. And so I'd gone outside and I was playing and my granddad came up from the farm. And he stopped and was picking at me. And I said, did you hear? And I told him the news. And he went in the house and I'd stolen granny's thunder. I had shared the bad news before she got to. And she was so mad at me. And she said, I want you to understand something. When we hear stuff like that, you just don't tell everybody. Well, you do. <laughs> but I want to be the one that tells it. You ever get a juicy tid 
little tidbit that you just can't wait to go tell. The gospel is just the opposite of that. The gospel is good news. That, that, it's, it's like that Johnny Cash song, Bad News. He says, bad news travels like wildfire, good news travels slow. We're behind. Paul says, we're behind. The world is filled with bad news. In the first century, he says, the world is filled with bad news and we owe a debt to share it with everybody, to the wise and to the foolish and to whoever. We are obligated to share the good news of Jesus. That it is not just my job, it is all of our jobs together because of our mutual fellowship and our level playing field of the cross that we are obligated, we owe a debt to no matter who it is that we don't get to pick it out. I, I went by the bookstore and I go into Family Christian and I'm walking through the store and they always come up to me and it's always funny um, and I know it's because of the way I look and the way I sound and, and the whole bit, you know. But they'll always be like, what are you, you know, hey, can we help you, you know. And the, the, the last time I was in there, I went in there with a purpose. I was looking for some stuff on Romans. and So I'd gone in. Well, I've discovered that the Bible bookstores of the day don't have that kind of stuff. They've got the frou-frou. And they sell a few Bibles and a few CDs and a few, hey, if you want to make a million dollars, you know, whatever type of books. But So I go in and I'm walking through the store and I'm looking for their commentary section. And I get over and I'm, and I'm looking and this lady comes up and says, hey, I've got something to show you that you'll like. And I went, really? And she said, yes. And I said, well, lead the way. And we go back, and she goes, look, ta-da! And I went, oh. It was all this Duck Dynasty stuff. And I was like, really? Why did you bring me over here? She goes, you look just like that guy right there. And I went, I am that guy right there. Would you like me to autograph those? And I almost had her convinced to let me set up some tables and sign books. And then she went, you know... So I said, take me over, you know, talk, show me where the books are. And then I said, what do you have on church growth? So she takes me over this whole section. And, and so I'm looking at the books and I was amazed because it is always, you know, the, the, the greatest trend or the whatever. But what was missing from all that, and I'm not, you know, going, hey, I'm smarter than all these guys because obviously they know something I don't. But what was amazing to me is Paul says the gospel's for who? He says for the Greeks and the non-Greeks and for the wise and for the foolish. The gospel is for everybody. And it was like, who is your target group? And I understand that. Hey, I'm a hunter. When I'm hunting deer, I want to shoot squirrels, but I don't. Besides that, you know, a 300 wind mag would blow a hole in a squirrel. You know? And besides that, because if you shoot the squirrel, then you know. And so then I try. I have tried psyching them out. I always just announce to the woods, I'm squirrel hunting today, dear, you're safe. Trying to fool them, it never seems to work. But we... Yes, there, there's an idea of targeting areas, but we are not looking for people. There was a guy many years ago here that was a part of the church that said to me, hey, you know what you need to do? I said, what's that? He said, you need to get out and convert a millionaire so we no longer have any money issues. So when you go find them, I'll convert them, I'll do my part. You know, I, it's like, really, is that the way we view people? The way we view people is people, we know the answer. We've come to the cross. We have a debt to share the good news of Jesus with them. That goes back to what I said earlier. Whatever we're doing here, we need to be doing things that say, listen, this is going to make a difference for you come Tuesday. Remember last Sunday when I was taking Tanner's confession or really just saying, and I said to Tanner, I said, you know, one of these days you're going to have some important decisions like do I put a ring on that girl's finger or do I go to college? And I said, but the greatest decision that you're making began last Sunday and that was to put on his Lord in baptism. 
That's where it all begins. Is that He is part of the family. So we are obligated to share the gospel. But look further at what He says. Finally, He says in verse 16 and 17, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is from is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now think about this. He says the gospel is our power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's, it's the power, the, the Greek word, and of course everybody that's ever been in church. If you've been in church very long, you will have heard about the gospel being the power of God unto salvation. And somebody will have, some Greek scholar who's smarter than me will tell you that the word there is dynamo from where we get the word dynamite and talk about the explosive power. It's just that he's saying here that the power, the very power of who we are, so we have a fellowship in the gospel. We're obligated to share the gospel. And he says that gospel message is powerful. And he says he's not ashamed of it. When he says he's not ashamed of it, you have to understand something. He says, well, why would I be ashamed? You know, why would he be ashamed of, of the power? You've got to understand that Paul would have had times that he would have been tempted to go, man, I'm not, so you know, I'm among this group of people here and I'm kind of afraid to say anything. It happens to him in the book of Acts. In Acts 17, he is preaching. Uh, the group of people look at him and there were, there were philosophers that traveled around and people would say, oh, this guy is here, this person is here and they're going to speak. And so people would gather in and they would hear them speak. And then there were those that would get just a little bit of philosophy. Just a little tidbit of it. And that's what they would talk about. They wouldn't really understand it. They would just get just a, a little bit of it. And there was a bird that caused a lot of problems with the fruit crops. Because what they would do is they would pack the fruit and just get the seeds out. But it would ruin the fruit. And so they began to call these people that weren't the great philosophers, but the people that had just heard a philosopher speak and went, Hey, I could copy their message. And they would say, seed pickers. And so Paul shows up in Athens and they're like, well, let's hear what this seed picker has to say. And Paul gets up and he preaches the gospel. And when he gets to the end of it, they're like, uh, you just said that God died and then God came back to life? Uh, yeah, and they're very skeptical and they walk away. You have enough people scoff at you. You have enough people go, well, I'm not really interested in what you have to say. And we begin to question, do I say anything? And that's why when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it's so important that Paul says, he goes, the, the message of the cross... Don't ever lose sight of the message of the cross. Then that's why it's so tempting in our culture today for us to go, well, hey, let's talk about our good works. Let's talk about our youth programs. Let's talk about our Sunday school programs. Let's talk about our building. Let's, let's, talk, let's build a gym and let's build this and let's build that and let's do all of that because that's going to draw people in because we lose confidence in the power of the cross. And Paul says, I, I long to know nothing among you to the Corinthian church except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He says it is the power of the cross and he says to the wise it is foolishness. To the powerful it is weakness. To the Jews they scoff at it but to those that are being saved it is the power of God. So Paul says the gospel, the good news, it is so simple. I, I remember hearing it for the first time and having gone to church... From the time I was a baby till I was 16 years old, I had gone to church. And finally, when I got a job and I was working on the weekends, I could say to my mother, guilt-free, I'm not going to church with you this Sunday because I have to work. Tyson is making me work, Mom. And so I could stay home guilt-free. And so, you know, not going. And even though I'd moved out when I was 16 years old and wasn't living in their home, she would still look at me very longingly like, I sure hope you're going to go to church with me and I wouldn't go. 
But I remember going back to church and being in a, and hearing, and I shared this several months ago, about being in a church and hearing this man that most people wouldn't have given the, the time of day. He was older than Dirk's uncle. And he stood up and he preached this message. And for the first time I ever remember hearing the good news of the gospel. That he told me, for the first time ever I ever heard, he says, your sins are forgiven through Jesus. And because of that, you will live eternally. If somebody kills you, you'll go on living. Because you have had your sins cleansed and Jesus conquered death at the grave. Wow! That was good news to me. So Paul says, the power of God is his message, is his message of redemption, of saving the world. It is his. And then notice what he says. He says, it is the power of, that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. It's not just for one group of people. It's for everybody. It's not just for us. It's for everybody. It is our power. It is our power. We will worry about, well, what if I say something to somebody and they ask me a question I don't know? Don't worry about the questions you can't answer. Use the power. Share the message. He said it is a message of salvation because we were lost and now we're saved. We're in a world that is lost. Paul says, man, the church is, yes, it's in Rome, but there's a lot of lost people there. When we look at our community, we have a lot of lost people. We know the answer. I'm telling you something. It is so easy for us as believing people to get so wrapped up into thinking that there is a political answer or a law that could be passed or something that could be done or a protest that could be done. I, I shared this. I'm done with protest. I'm not taking part in any more protest. You want to protest? You personally want to participate in protest? I will support you. I will pray for you, but I'm done. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be, I, I, I've, and it's been, oh, it's been tough. It's been worse than quitting smoking for me. Because I've been online and I will see something and I'll go, oh, oh, I need to share that. I need to make sure that this person in my friends list sees this so I can rub it in their nose. And I went, nope, not going to, just go on. And there's been a couple of times that I fail because it's a habit. I want to be about the good news. I want to be about sharing the good news of Jesus. Why? Because I was lost and now I'm found. I know people that are lost and need the message of Jesus. I need to be sharing it with them. So he says, look further at what he says. I keep losing those. I can't keep up with my glasses today. Listen to what he says. He says, for the gospel, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. You see, God couldn't as a just and righteous God, and we're going to learn this in Romans 3, but as a just and righteous God, he couldn't just go, hey Daniel, we're good. You know all those bad things you did? We're good. He couldn't just declare me right without and be just. He couldn't do that. But sending His Son to earth, revealing who He is, and then dying on the cross and coming back to life, he could say, I am now just because I offered the sacrifice. So Daniel, you've believed that message, you're good. The righteousness of God is revealed. How is the righteousness of God revealed? It's, it's first of all, it's a divine attribute in who he is. God is righteous. Now think about that. God is a righteous God. If you go back and you read the Old Testament, you know all that killing that went on in the Old Testament? You know why God did all that killing? Because He is a righteous God. So it's His attribute. And then it shows us something else about God in His righteousness. His activity. He rescued us. God says, I'm going to kill my son for you. 
the activity that I will perform there on the cross will show who I am and then it is his divine achievement because he says guess what I will declare you righteous I can't be righteous outside of the blood of Jesus the Old Testament also proves that God says here's my standard follow it what'd they do? messed it up didn't they? we go oh well that was them let us try there's no way Many, many years ago, too many years to really remember, but I was a youth minister and we took a group of kids to Searcy, Arkansas to a program and I will never forget this. At the last thing that we were there, one of the guys spoke and when he spoke he said, see how long you can go without complaining today. We made it to the parking lot. I got the kids gathered up and somebody said, Oh man, I'm going to have to ride with them in that car again and he really smells bad and she, she whines all the time and this one drives too fast and I get car sick and oh, Mr. Daniel, please don't make me ride with them. And one girl that was riding with me and Debbie was like, Please don't take me at home at all. You know what my home life is like and I really don't want to go there. Can I just come and live with you and Debbie? And I'm looking at all these other little kids, teenagers, going, do you know what this kid's going through? I want to just beat you. Because she's saying, can I live with you and Debbie? Because you know what my home is like. And I've got to take her home. And she gets really quiet when we're two blocks from her house. She lived, she grew up in the Fayetteville Housing Authority. And if you know where that's at, you know what I'm talking about. And she didn't want to go. And I felt so sorry for her. And it was heartbreaking. But we made it to the parking lot without complaining. We can't do it. We can't go without sinning. Any of you want to say you didn't sin yesterday? You know? I did really well. I stayed home. Worked in the yard. Did really well. Did really, really well throughout the morning. Then the afternoon came. Hit that finger right there. Man, I just, I hit it. And I was like, you know. And I look up and the neighbor kids who love, have fallen in love with me are just like. <laughs> and I was like, I smashed my finger and it hurt, okay? And they were like, yeah. So I go out yesterday afternoon and I'm getting some stuff out of the bed of the truck. I had some ratchet straps back there and I'm rolling them up because I'm real funny about it. And I'm, I'm rolling my ratchet straps up and I look up and they're at the end of the driveway and they go, Mr. Daniel! Mr. Daniel! And Sam looks at me and goes, How's your finger, Mr. Daniel? <laughs> it's better? Good, glad to hear it. Off down the street he goes and comes back, you know. And this little sister rides up and goes, How you feeling, Mr. Daniel? Are you better than you were in the backyard? I'm a lot better. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, golly, nothing like being convicted. The Holy Spirit's bad enough, but these two are awful. <laughs> and that finger still hurts today. But I thought, man, I've done so well today. The morning didn't start off real good, but it got better. And then that happened. We can't do it. But because we come to the level ground of the cross, we have the blood of Jesus and we are declared righteous by God. And we accept it by faith. He says the righteous will live by faith. He quotes Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. And it's the great faith text. And he says the righteous... Because of our faith, we are made righteous in what God has done. And the righteous live by faith. There's a great deal of argument about how to translate it. So I'm just giving you both. Because I think it, the whole message is there. The righteous live by faith. And the righteous are made righteous by their faith. From faith to faith. We live by faith. 
we have the power of the gospel. The rest of this book, you know, next week, it got to go south for a little bit. It's difficult. But what he does in chapter 1, verse 18 and following, is he explains to us, we're sinners. We need the gospel. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for everything you give us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your care. Thank you for loving us so much that you gave us Jesus. We thank you for the gospel message we have to share. We ask you today, Lord, to guide us and lead us. Thank you that we could be together. Thank you for making us a family. Thank you for loving us. Now put your love in our hearts and help us to share it. Through the blessed name of our Savior Jesus who loved us so much he gave himself that we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a song.